Okay. All right. Okay. So, I'll just tell what we're doing first quickly. So, hi everyone. Thanks for joining the webinar. Uh, uh, we have Mags Deneen joining us this evening, which is great. We're delighted to have her uh, all the way virtually from Cork, as we just proudly said. Uh, so, hopefully, the signal holds up in her beautiful part of the world, but I'm sure we'll be fine. Uh, we're going to record the webinar again like we did the last day, so uh, we'll just go through it, edit it, and take out any swear words that me and Darren use uh, by tomorrow, and it'll be up on the YouTube channel tomorrow as well. Uh, as per, if anyone missed, anyone wasn't here the last day, just for questions and that as well, we'll try and keep it as interactive as we can. Uh, the talk's probably going to last about 40, 45 minutes of mags, but she's happy to field any questions that, uh, that to come up during the way. So you can use the raise hand function or there's a Q&A box. You can actually just put the question straight in as well, which is a good idea and we can get through them. So that way we can kind of keep motoring through and we can answer a few during it. And we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end with a 15, 20 minutes set aside at the end for everyone to ask questions. So everyone's just automatically muted just to keep out the background noise and make sure the quality is as good as possible. But as I said, just raise your hand or ask a question if you have any comments or you can even if you want to put a comment or in the chat box. That would be great as well. So uh, we'll leave you in the capable hands of Mags and we'll see you shortly. Don't know what that sound was. Um, look, thanks very much, Patrick. Uh, thanks, Darren. Thanks, Gus. Uh, delighted to be here. I hope you can understand me with the Cork accent, as pointed out so nicely there by Darren. Um, okay, so I wanted to talk about outcomes um, and why, basically, I think effort is your problem. Um, the last couple of presentations I gave, I have started them with this disclaimer. Now the, I guess, what I share as part of this presentation, it's my opinion and basically you can uh, take it or leave it, argue a point, whatever. Um, I don't really mind. Um, but what I think is really, really interesting is practically from the moment we're born, we are rewarded for effort. Now, when I googled effort um, and school reports, I found online what is allegedly Johnny Cash's school report. And in that, and that was from 1948 to 1949, he was evaluated on effort, not on outcomes. And I thought that was kind of interesting. And then when I think of my own school reports, there were a lot of, oh, she must try harder. Um, she needs to make more of an effort. Um, and, you know, it's, it's all the harder you work, the better you're going to do. Um, the more stuff you do, uh, the better you're going to do. And I personally think that's a bit of a mistake. So even in software, in software delivery, there is an emphasis on how much work we've completed. Um, 20 years ago, there was an emphasis on things like the number of test cases, the number of lines of code, you know, more is better. Um, and then more recently, things like um, burn down charts. And I guess burn down charts, they, they tell us, they take our estimates that we've put in for a user story and they work out whether or not we're going to have um, completed all the user stories that we've committed to by the end of a sprint. Um, now, the, look, it's, it's a tool, I guess it, it works, um, but it's based on an awful lot of uh, various assumptions. So it's based on the assumption that the estimates that we put together in the first place were accurate. Um, and I guess, the estimates that we used to do anyway as part of Strom, they were all based on, you know, things like in Australia to us, schooners, you know, t-shirt sizes, various things like that. But to be quite honest, we were pretty useless at estimating. Um, you know, these charts, they're based on the assumption that the time available is certain. Um, there are an awful lot of assumptions around it that to be honest, I, I think there's, I guess, to, to me, life is not predictable. Um, I don't think these work very, very well. Um, you know, they, these charts that we do normally within Agile, they look at the number of story points within an iteration. And, you know, story points are themselves subjective. Um, and they're based on the assumption that the stories that we're delivering are actually valuable. And that assumes that we understand what value means. 
Um, and they're based on the assumption that after implementing the stories, our, our business will, be in a, will have gotten something positive out of it and that it'll be in a better position than it was beforehand. Um, now, when you talk to someone outside of a delivery team, they will probably view something as in, look, the greater the number of stories that are delivered, um, the greater the number of the features, the, the better the team is doing. But when I take a look at something like this, the only conclusion I can draw is that the higher the effort, the higher the cost. Um, there is no mention of benefit. There is no mention of benefit to the business. And if you're working with a product owner who isn't all that experienced, um, there might be an awful lot of waste going in. Now, I'll be honest with you, my, um, my scrum experience hasn't been great. It, it wasn't pretty because the teams I worked in, we couldn't estimate to save our lives. Um, most of the time, we didn't have a product owner. We worked in a mini waterfall manner and we were afraid to question our boss. So nothing got done or got moved to ready for test until late in the sprint. And for the first half of the sprint, we normally spent our time begging for developers to give us the time of day and to explain user stories to us. And then they were often too busy to help us out. Um, our scrum board often looked like this, you know, one day to go in the sprint, there is an awful lot of stories that are started but not finished. The smallest, um, least complex story is done and we we're wondering how on earth are we going to continue? And do you know what? Worse still, the very last afternoon of a sprint, and it, was, it normally happened on, um, like we used to finish our sprints on a Friday. And if that Friday was just before a bank holiday Monday, then guaranteed late in the afternoon, there was what I used to call the grand unveiling we'd get um, the most complex features delivered. Everything suddenly moved, you know, from in progress to ready for test or ready for QA or whatever that status was. Um, so it looked as if the burn down chart was fantastic, but it meant that as testers, we were really, really unhappy. And then the following week, we'd spend it trying to catch up and trying to figure out if it was okay to leave untested code in the code base or if we should take it out. Um, we, you know, we often didn't know what to do. So that, that was my reality with, with Scrum. And you know what, hindsight is a really, really uh, great thing. So now when I think about how we had approached Scrum, it was almost like the movie uh, Groundhog Day. So the process we adopted for Scrum was as follows. So we'd start with a requirement or a story that wasn't quite understood. Then we'd rush through a design. We'd um, underestimate. We'd write some code. We wouldn't bother doing TDD or unit testing or anything like that. And then we'd throw it at someone to test it. Then we'd realize that it was incomplete. And then because the clock was ticking, we'd ship it. So end result, customer wasn't quite happy. Then after that, we'd say, okay, well now we're really stuck for time. So what we'll do is we'll say all these bugs aren't really bugs, um, that the testers just perhaps didn't understand the story and we'll push it out and we'll fix those bugs later. Um, and then, we said, okay, great, happy, burn down chart is great. We're, we've achieved great velocity. Let's do it all over again. But the thing is, we were building up massive piles of technical debt as, as we used this approach. And at the same time, we, were, we never questioned whether or not what we delivered was really required um, by the customer in, in the first place. So the thing that's really concerning is that we're not alone in this approach. You know, if you go to a conference and if you listen to the keynotes, my view was that we were doing something really, really, really badly. But then I, I Googled, um, and you know, if it's on Google, it must be right. But I, I Googled some problems that people have delivering the software. 
And some of the stats are absolutely shocking. Now, bearing in mind that you can probably find a statistic to prove anything you want or disprove anything you want, um, these figures are still really, really concerning. Um, now, I was looking at something by, uh, how, not sure if I can pronounce his name properly, um, Gyoko Adkik, who came up with the concept of impact mapping. And one paper that he references is called Online Experimentation at Microsoft. And that's really worth um, taking a look at it. And, you know, when we talk agile, we talk about adding value, um, adding business value. But there was a study done at Microsoft and of all the projects that they implemented, what they said was that only one third of the ideas that were implemented actually improved what they were hoping they'd improve. A third of the ideas did nothing and a third had a negative impact. Now, if you think about it, that's pretty horrific. That's an awful waste of time. Um, and you know, even at Amazon, um, he mentioned in a presentation that under 50% of, of uh, projects had um, or added positive business value. So, you know, something, something is really going wrong in how we build and how we measure and how we estimate and how we ship. There's something really wrong about that. Now, another problem I see is around ambiguity. We often use ambiguous words. We might have an idea in our head of what they mean, but they might mean something really, really different to everybody else. So even, so we talk about value. Um, when I looked up value, the, the most uh, clear definition that I could find was really around the importance, worth or usefulness or something. Now, I like the word useful. It, it tells me something. Um, and then, you know, even the word quality, um, Gerald Weinberg, you know, uh, I think his definition is value to somebody. Um, I think there are other definitions that say value to somebody who matters or value to somebody who matters at a point in time. But for us to deliver something of value, we need to get um, a, a common view of what that means. And we need, um, we need our team to share the same uh, view of it. So what I found was deep within the um, manifesto for agile software development, if you look at the principles of it, it says that one of the core principles of delivering in an agile manner is the art of maximizing the work um, not done. So this is really, really important because to me, it, it implies that it's not about the number of features or the number of stories. We should actually be trying to minimize the amount of work that we try and push through a sprint so that we have time to think about whether or not it's going to add value before we write the code. Now, I guess if value is equal to usefulness, then there definitely can't be a clear um, correlation between um, number of features and value. I love this picture of the remote controls. I know in our house, the remote looks a little bit like the one on the left, but I haven't a clue what half those buttons do. And to be honest, other than changing the volume and changing the station and maybe on and off, I don't touch any of them. So if number of features isn't um, correlated with um, value, where does that leave us? So more stuff does not imply more value in the same way that more test cases doesn't necessarily imply better quality. More bugs found doesn't necessarily imply more value. And also around this, we know that if we roll something out without trying it or without knowing that it's adding value, then at, once something goes out of production, it's really, really difficult um, to roll it back. And once it goes into production, um, we're, we're basically just after creating the legacy code of tomorrow and increasing our technical debt. So my definition of value is basically useful, solves the problem, or it does a job for me that either I don't want to do or 
um, that is low value to me that so that I can spend my time doing something else. And also value means a benefit. And I guess that brings me on to outcomes. So over the years, I spent an awful lot of time trying to tell people what I was doing, either as a software tester or a software developer. But once I spoke to people outside of my team, they really didn't care. Um, so if I said, guess what, um, you know, I've created a new test for something, they didn't care. If I said, look, we've just implemented 14 features, they didn't care. Um, it, it was as if I was speaking a different language to, uh, to people outside of teams, particularly um, if that person worked in finance or something like that, they saw us as um, being a cost, not necessarily adding a benefit. So I was looking for some way to translate what a delivery team does and translate it in a way so that people outside of the delivery team would understand. Um, and I came across what Dr. Alistair Coburn comes across or describes as the first real post-agile framework. And it's something called um, Mobius. And basically what this does is, okay, so when I say outcome, what I mean is the effect of an action. Um, and what, what this approach does is it says, okay, so if you want to change something, if you want to deliver software, if you want to um, improve how you deliver software, if you want to do software testing, um, you always start with a problem. And in order to progress, you need to dig down into that problem. You need to explore it. You need to understand the problem and why it's a problem at a particular point in time. And you need to be able to somehow baseline that problem. Um, or measure it or come up with a concrete way of describing it. Um, once you have that, then you can take a step further and you can look at various options in order to, I won't say solve the problem, but I guess potential solutions we'll say. Now, anytime you've got a problem, then yes, you'll have, a number of potential solutions, but each of those potential solutions is just a hypothesis. So by that, I mean, you hypothesize that by, uh, you, you've got a hypothesis that by doing something, it's going to have a positive impact on the problem. Um, you might come up with a number of those hypotheses, so you want to come up with some way of prioritizing them. And then you want to test those hypotheses or do some or deliver those hypotheses or execute a test, um, generate a result, and then assess whether or not you've had an impact on the problem. Now, a lot of what I did when I was looking at improving software testing was I assumed that implementing, you know, let's say the, the metrics from Accelerate or implementing TDD or implementing unit testing, I assumed that they would make something better. But I actually never bothered to measure how bad that something was in the first place. So then I was never able to say whether or not what I had actually done really had an impact on, on the problem or not. So with, um, with Mobius, what it does and um so okay so what is mobius um mobius is a navigator that aligns delivered value with strategic intent now ultimately it helps us solve problems in the most direct manner possible personally i think it's absolutely superb um, it helps me think about problems and helps me to prioritize what I do at work in a much more cohesive manner. And it enables me explain what I'm doing to people outside of my team. So Mobius is an idea that, um, that a lady called Gabrielle Benefield came up with. Um, and basically, I guess, as testers, we tend to focus on delivery which is the delivery side of, of this Mobius loop. 
but we need to find a balance between investigating a problem and delivering a potential solution. So as testers and as developers, we're quite happy going around and having sprint after sprint after sprint, but it's a bit like swimming underwater without coming up for air. We have to constantly come back and just see what's happening in the business. Because I mean, look, if you look at the way things have changed in, in the last four months, if we kept doing the same thing, you know, it would be a bit like being stuck in a big brother house and not knowing what's after changing in the world. And I, I know that COVID is an extreme example, but even before COVID, if we had kept staying in our delivery loops, we'd miss all the, all the things that were going on at a business level. And things change pretty, ha pretty quick in a business world. So we need to know that what we're working on is still the best way for us to be spending our, um, our time. Now, in, in this, um, effort is irrelevant. So it's really more about impact. Um, again, starts with a problem definition, and then it empowers us to actually find something that's going to solve that problem. Um, it asks us to prove that what we're doing is having a positive impact and not wasting time and money. And I found that it can be applied to all aspects of software delivery, including process improvement, and it can help us to, uh, to reduce the impact of um, feature factories. And I think we're also probably guilty of having feature factories within testing and process improvement and quality engineering, but that's that's um, a story for another day. So Mobius in a nutshell. So it always starts with a problem or a job that someone needs to do. Now we start by doing a deep dive to, uh, to really try and get to grips with what the problem is. We can use techniques such as the five whys to do a bit of um, digging. Um, one thing that's important in this is why, why is there motivation or what is the motivation to fix the problem now? Um, you see, if it's not an, an important now, then you won't have buy-in. And if the problem isn't big enough, you won't have buy-in. So if you start off without buy-in on something like this, then you will have to fight two, three, four times as hard after the event in order to prove or in order to, to get people to give you time um, and basically um, agree with what you're doing. Um, so if you start with a problem rather than a pet solution, you're, you're already on the right track. Um, it's really important to measure the problem. Now you can come up with a name of a measure, um, you know, you can come up with a scale for it. And, and that's something that, that you'll come back to um, in the subsequent um, journey through the Mobius loop. Um, one thing that exploring the problem also allows you to do is basically create commitment so that everybody's working on, uh, I guess, off, off the same scorecard. Um, and one thing I've learned the hard way about uh, problems is that it's really important to ask, what is the problem? Not, what do you want? Um, if you ask a customer, what do you want? You'll be there for hours. Um, even my sons, I have twin boys and they made their first Holy Communion last year. And I said to them, so guys, what do you want? And they both said that they wanted to dress like James Bond for their first Holy Communion. Whereas if I had rephrased the question, I would probably have um, you know, I guess gotten a more clear idea of, of what the problem is. Um, so once you've identified a problem and once you know how to measure it, the next thing is taking a look at options. So with options, you probably have a pet solution. Um, so for example, I've worked in places where you know, everybody said, oh, that should be covered by unit testing. Now, unit testing was a pet solution, but there was no, we couldn't prove that by implementing 
unit testing that there would be an impact on the problem at that point in time. Um, we could have measured it and we could have done some kind of a test to see if implementing unit testing would make a certain problem better or worse. Um, but, you, you know, I think we all have uh, pet solutions that if something goes wrong, the very first thing we go to is that particular pet solution. Um, and it's important that we kill the pet solution or the pet option really early. Um, we have to prioritize various options so that we can test the one we think is most likely to have an impact first. Um, ways that we can prioritize options, one way is called ICE. So it's basically where we have a hypothesis and we allocate a score for the impact we think it's going to have on the problem, the confidence we have in our ability to implement it and then the ease of the implementation. Um, also with options, you always need more than one option. Ideally, you need three or four at least before you can decide, before you can make a good decision. And you want to keep your, I suppose, keep as many possibilities available to yourself for as long as possible. Um, one thing with hypotheses is what you're looking for is things to try out. So you're not married to your hypothesis, you're just doing something that, that you can try. Then moving on to the delivery side of the loop, it's basically, you've got a hypothesis, how soon can you see whether or not that actually worked? How soon can you actually get a result uh, from your experiment? And it's, it's all about doing things as smart as you possibly can, and not wasting time. So in terms of options, I was at a workshop in February in Cork, um, Darren, and I suppose I was wondering, and I, I was, um, it was a workshop given by Dave Farley, and he, I asked him about uh, things like return on investment and, you know, how do you work out whether or not something is worthwhile trying? And it gave me this really, really cool way of evaluating things. So, so basically, let's say it costs you a cup of coffee in order to try something out. And if the potential benefit of that is going to be a house, then obviously it's worth your while. If it's going to cost you a cup of coffee and the most you can possibly hope to get back from it is a cup of coffee, then you make up your own mind as, whether you, or as to whether or not you want to do it. If it's going to cost you a car and you'll get back a cup of coffee, then it's probably not worth doing. Um, if it's going to cost you a sun holiday and you might um, benefit by a cup of coffee, then it's probably not worth doing either. But I thought this is a really, really nice way of, um, of prioritizing options and, and looking at return on investment. Um, now, uh, I think it was last week, uh, Joao Proenza, he was talking about, um, what was it? Uh, he, was, he had a presentation on whether or not you should delete um, automated tests. And he mentioned a number of uh, biases in that. And I, I think it, biases and uh, um, we're, we, are, we all have biases, but um, some of the ones that impact our ability to see options or see solutions are, um, are these ones I list. So the first one, you know, I talk about a pet solution um, and it's, Another uh, term for it is law of the instrument, so or Maslow's hammer. So let's say if we're trained as a software developer, then we will see every problem we come across as solvable by writing code. So um, another name for this is golden hammer. Um, but obviously, I mean, if you think more features doesn't mean more value, sometimes we're better off not writing any code at all in order to solve a problem. Um, another bias that I hadn't heard of until Joao mentioned it was the IKEA effect. 
And I love this one because it basically says that if you've been involved in partially building something, then um, you feel you, you feel a sense of ownership for it and you're very reluctant to let it go. And then that leads onto the sunk costs fallacy where it's very hard to move on. So you're doing something, you've been doing it for a long time, you're invested in it. And even though you know it's not having an impact on anything and it's not doing your, your, your team or your organization any good, it's still really, really hard to let go. And then the third one that I thought was interesting is called the choice overload bias. And that's where the more options you've got ahead of you or in, in front of you, the more difficult it is to actually make any decision. Um, you know, you, you just feel, God, there are too many things here for me to, to choose from. Now, with all of these, so they're all biases that are going to influence us. But by using uh, prioritization of outcomes, it'll help um, keep us accountable. And it, it'll also keep at least some of our biases in check. So um, case study. So we've been playing with outcomes now for a year and a half. And one client that we worked with basically said, look, we need you to come in and set up an automation framework for, your, for our regression tests. And that was fine. So we went in and we used this approach. Um, so we had a workshop and we talked, and these were just some of the techniques we used. So we wanted to understand the problem space. And we used the five whys to find out why they wanted us to automate regression tests in the first place. So what we found was that this was a team that was working at uh, capacity, and they were unable to keep to complete the tasks they needed to do uh, within a sprint cycle. Their sales team had sold their product to an awful lot of new customers and they couldn't even keep on top of uh, their existing clients, not to mind um, running tests in order to cover the regression scenarios for new ones. So we used that in order to feed into our solution. Then in order to come up with what to measure, we used metrics-based process maps to basically draw out where people were spending their time, um, what lead time was involved, what is the processing time, and how many people were involved in doing tasks um, around regression testing. Um, we used event storming to help us understand uh, business value, sorry, not business value, um, business process flow, um, and highlight triggers and events along the way. So we used that in order to just understand um, the flow through their organization. And then we used a technique called priority sliders, which enabled us to um, create a common view of quality and prioritize various quality attributes within it. Um, so I guess whoever you are, you'll have your own techniques in order to dig into a problem and, uh, and really understand how to measure the extent of the problem in the first place. Uh, when we were evaluating the options, we used impact, confidence and ease in order to do it. And then in terms of uh, delivery, we basically worked in really, really short sprint cycles um, of five days. We delivered something at the end of every five days. And then we assessed what we had done against the problem and we pivoted if we needed to. Um, with metrics based process maps, so this is what it, it looked like. Um, so in each sprint, there was, um, we spent some time planning testing. Uh, we found that uh, the lead time was actually quite high for when they were able to start uh, running, ex um, running regression tests. We found that the process time was quite high and we found that only a low number of their customers could be covered. So we made a number of, of um, observations around this. We used um, event storming, which is really, really, uh, it's a great technique. Um, 
and we got uh, their architect to just talk us through the events that went through their system. Um, and at that stage, we were all in a, in a workshop together. So we used it in order to define our tests, um, the core tests that we would automate. Um, so a test case, and this is basically based on event storming. A test case, uh, we used, we asked the business to identify high level steps. Um, the business and the technical subject matter experts defined the triggers. And then um, the tech subject matter experts defined the outputs. And then we double checked with QA to see if there were any additional checks that needed to be done. Oops, I know I don't need to upgrade my version of Java, but that's very nice to know about it. Um, and every five days, what we did was rather than um, tracking effort, we started looking at, are we actually closer to achieving these outcomes or not? So we had various gauges um, such as, you know, initially something was taking 210 minutes to execute. How, how much have we gotten it down? How close are we to uh, the 20 minutes, which was our goal? Um, the same thing with upskilling people in the team. You know, it was, how, we had different gauges and how close are we to having a team that's capable of writing tests? Um, and during this engagement, what we found was that it's much easier to keep going if you can see yourself getting closer to a goal. I think it's the same, you know, if you're working on fitness or you're working to lose weight or whatever, it's much easier to say, look, I am getting so much closer rather than I've been to the gym 30 times in the last two months. Um, during this engagement, we had to change our tool set completely um, halfway through our, well, 14 weeks into the engagement, but we were still able to um, achieve outcomes. And what we achieved, and this is, I, I believe that this is 100% based on Mobius, is we got some fairly compelling outcomes. We achieved compelling outcomes. And I believe that every delivery team, like this stuff isn't rocket science. These are the kind of things that every delivery team achieves, but we just don't make it visible outside of the team. So like, this was our experience with outcomes. And it's something that, um, you know, it, it gave us a voice. It gave our delivery team a voice and we were able to prove that we had an impact on the problem that they had in, in the first place. So it had taken them five days to actually scale in order to support one additional client. But we got that down to one hour through automation. So ways, I suppose, going forward, if, outcome, if you're interested in becoming outcome focused, it's really important to understand your, your purpose, um, you know, the purpose of your team. What is it that you're trying to achieve? And what is the problem that you're trying to solve? And then the really, really hard part is stop to, to stop doing what you're doing and be open to try something different if what you're doing isn't bringing you any closer to achieving an outcome, irrespective of how much you've invested in it at a particular point in time. You know, it's, if you're doing something that isn't getting you closer to solving a problem, then irrespective of how much time you spend on it, it's still waste. And I suppose another thing is to remember that it, it is all about experimentation. It's not a lifetime commitment. You don't have to marry it. Um, some of the benefits that we've seen by being um, outcome-based, I suppose the, the big thing is that this approach, well, there, there are multiple benefits, but one thing is it allows us to take, to really consider our next steps. And in times of uncertainty, that's really, really important. Um, and Marie Chara talks about, um, you know, if you're in a very, very stable environment, you can take big, massive leaps ahead. Whereas if you're walking on snow or I guess sand, something that's unstable, you need to take small steps. Um, and yeah, that's it. That's the end of my presentation. So happy to take any questions. Cool, thanks, Max. That was very interesting. 
Uh, we'll open the floor to questions. Uh, did you, Connor? Uh, questions we got. One second, sure. so the panel's here. So if there's any questions, you can just raise your hand and we'll come straight to you, or you can put it in the Q and A box, either or. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. All at once. Here we go. Okay, cool. So the question from Gus here. Uh, the Mobius loop is a very interesting concept. Have you used it for process improvement? Yes. Um, okay, so process improvement is an interesting one. I think with process improvement, um, you, it, it can be quite overwhelming when you see lots of things that you feel are wrong, lots of things that are going badly. What I use Mobius for is just to help me figure out which problem to focus on. Um, so, yes, we've used it for process improvement. Since I started using it, I guess I'm probably um, doing the, uh, you know, the golden hammer bias thing. I'm using it a lot, um, but it's helping me to focus on important things and to uh, just basically not focus on things that aren't going to add value. Okay, cool. Thanks for that. Uh, next question is from Lisa Crispin. Hey, Lisa, how are you? Uh, you mentioned Alistair Cockburn, but I wasn't sure which idea of his you've tried. Okay, I, me I, men I mentioned Alistair Cockburn. So Alistair um, Cockburn is a fan of Mobius. So uh, a couple of months ago, he said that he felt that Mobius is the first uh, real post-agile framework. Um, so that's why I mentioned him. Okay, cool. Any other questions? Anyone else uh, would like to ask any questions to Mags? Do we all jump out at once? Nope. Final chance? Actually, I see one. Yeah. Oh, another one coming in there now. From Honey Chawla. Let's say you have 5,000 plus UI tests. Can we apply this concept in already existing framework as it may take time to show the value of the new approach and with a restricted number of resources? They are busy and working on releases lined up in the roadmap. Okay. So, right, so what's the question there? Look, I think it's, this concept is really, really important. But I guess what I'd say to you is, what is the, what is the problem that you're trying to solve here? Um, you know, as it may take time to show a new approach. Yeah, okay, so what I'd be looking at is what's the shortest, cheapest, easiest experiment that you can conduct in order to, in, in order to, to test your hypothesis. Um, you know, d don't be overwhelmed by the size of having 5,000 plus UI tests. It's really, what is the problem that you're trying to solve? If you, know, if you have that many tests, are you testing the right thing? Are you actually, are they adding value? How can you prove that they're adding value? Um, I guess, and you know, working on releases lined up in a roadmap. Well, I would say in this, at this particular time, does your roadmap still make sense? If you have an approach like um, like Mobius, that'll allow you to pivot quicker. I hope that answers your question. Cool, honey, I'll just unmute you there. I hope that asked your question there. If you have any other thoughts, please do let us know. Uh, we have time for one or two more, just keep this one. A uh, question okay. from uh, Walter, uh, of course. Uh, yeah. what, is, what is my go-to material to learn about Mobius? Okay, I would... A couple of things. Um, one of them, uh, there is uh, Red Hat. They've got an open practice library. It's https openpracticelibrary.com. And the other one is, uh, I think Gabrielle's website is mobiusoutcomedelivery.com. Or you, or you can get in touch with me after this. Um, they're probably the, the two main places uh, that, that I'd suggest looking at. Okay, cool. We have time for one more of anyone's uh, final question. Not plenty of good positive uh, feedback coming in the chat box as well there, which is great. So thanks, Megan and Jeff, for positive comments there. So 
weather sees any of mag is always nice. All right, good, good stuff. And look, just reach out to me afterwards. Um, there is no bother. Yeah, so thanks a million, lads. Uh, thanks, Mags, for taking the time to do the talk. Really appreciate it at the moment, particularly when everyone has nothing else to do. Uh, let's try and stay positive. Uh, this talk has been recorded, so we'll post it up tomorrow for anyone that couldn't attend or any of your colleagues that you think is worthwhile sharing with them, please do. And uh, if it's okay, Mags, we'll tag her in all the talks tomorrow as well. So if anyone has any further questions or thoughts or comments or just pats on the back, please do reach out to her and we'll share her Twitter handle and her uh, LinkedIn maps post tomorrow. That's okay with you, Mags. And we'll Not about okay, cool. uh, so, so we have a few other things lined up for the next few weeks as well. We're just finalizing details, but again, good crowds again tonight. A lot of views on the last one on the AMA on YouTube as well. So, so long as there's an appetite to keep this going, we'll keep it going as well. It's good to keep our own sanity as well over the next few weeks while we're still in lockdown. So enjoy the extra three kilometers because I can go to detail. Okay, <laughs> stay safe. We'll talk to you all soon. Okay, okay take care. Thanks, bye. folks. Bye bye. Thanks, Max. Bye. Bye.